This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. You can see Charlie is here now. Let me explain how the show is going to go, because uh, I'm really, really excited about this show. So, essentially, uh, we're going to split the show into three parts. Uh, we've got a part on nutrition. Uh, what to eat, when to eat, what not to eat, drinking, routines. Uh, we've got a session on well-being uh so strategies like sleep activities and self-awareness of of well-being we've got a section on health so how to stay fit how to keep fit whether we should run how often should we run how often should we gym exercise how often when what how much and interspersed between all of this we have a opportunity to talk about charlie's fantastic and amazing um Uh, event that he has taking place next month now we're going to talk about this much much more with charlie but i know that that lucy as well is going to pin that event to the space so we can so we can check it out and and talk a little bit more about it as we go through uh this evening charlie are you there i am how are we doing good evening i'm not too bad and yourself Good, good. Yeah, all good, mate. All good this end. Thank good. you. Good. It is. It's excellent to hear your voice. Looking forward to this because I, I have a belly, Charlie, and I have been desperate to get rid of it um, for some time. So I'm hoping that by listening to you, and by also uh, hopefully uh, talking a little bit about your event that you've got coming up next month too, uh, we can we can crack it, and I can become a fitter version of myself and a better version of myself. Absolutely. Um, so, Charlie, before we start, can you give a little bit of background on who you are and what you're all about? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, my name is Charlie Burley. I am the teacher's health coach. Uh, I was a teacher for eight years, um, and I've literally just left the classroom f- fully uh, in January this year. And um, before that, I was part time for a little while, and then before that, I was full time. And essentially, I now work with teachers on their nutrition, their health and their well-being. So this is such an individual thing. It can mean different things to different people. Sometimes it's related to their well-being in school. Sometimes it's related to weight loss. Sometimes it's related just to overall health and fitness. So different people have different journeys and different elements come into it at different times. But the one thing I'll say, and this will probably underpin everything we talk about tonight, Tom, is that it's such an individual thing. So when when you inevitably ask me something about, I don't know, nutrition, a lot of my answers are going to be, first and foremost, it depends on the person. So it's all about taking someone and coaching someone through that journey because teaching is such a hard job. And, you know, I struggled with my health, fitness and mental well-being as well during my time in school, you know, sort of culminating in anxiety and panic attacks and some other horrible stuff that happened. And now I kind of want to help teachers who are basically, who, who are basically in the situation that I was in at one point before I kind of studied to be a nutritionist and looked at all this all this kind of stuff so yeah that's me in in a nutshell really super amazing and obviously um you i want to talk as well as we go through the show about a special event that you've got coming up next month can you just initially tell us a little bit about that yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know me, I'll, I'll ramble on for ages because it's something I'm really passionate <laughs> about. But in an absolute nutshell, uh, on the 22nd of October, we are launching the first ever Rewriting Wellbeing, the Health and Wellbeing uh, for Educators. Um, it's in London. It's an in-person event and it's something a bit different for wellbeing. You know, wellbeing has clearly become this buzzword. It's on policies. It features on, you know, websites and stuff. But really, what actionable change happens in most schools? And it's, it's nobody's fault, but it is everyone's responsibility. And it's a di- different kind of way to look at it. It's not just boring CPD and, you know, workshops for the sake of it. It's talks, it's workshops, it's sessions. It's a full day. You know, we're going to be going from 10 a.m. till about 4 p.m. in the afternoon <clears throat> with brunch, lunch, all the refreshments. But we've got all these little breakout activities planned. We've got all these times for you to network and chat to people. And it's basically about taking a practical approach to your health and well-being. It's not all theory. It's very, very practically practical, uh, practical based. Um, yeah. And we've got people who are in the classroom. We've got authors. We've got all sorts of people. But like I said, I'll ramble on for ages. So uh, no, that's absolutely I'll, fine. I'll let, I'll let you come. We off. we will come back to it later. But it's on the twenty second of October. It's in London. It's at ETC Venues. I've seen the venue. It's absolutely phenomenal. Mm. Um, it looks incredible. Um, 
it and also you, you you didn't mention there that, that that a large part of the event next month is going to be in support of education support isn't it yes yeah I didn't mention that part yeah so it's a non-profit event all proceeds are going to ed support it's a charity and an organization that i wish i knew about when i was in the classroom and unfortunately i didn't until after i'd kind of gone through that process myself but they yeah. do incredible incredible stuff they do support for teachers uh, emotional health mental health even financial supporting teachers with their families all sorts of different stuff connecting them with different agencies um, they're amazing fantastic and you've got andrew cowley you've got kimberly wilson jem foster uh holly and jenny from alfresco learning you've got simon bolger you've got oh my goodness you've got everyone there you've got yeah. your ambassadors there you've got tommy tommy tiktok you've got um kira kira classroom uh goodness me i know some of these people fantastic um now the the event in london it's on the 22nd of october now obviously we're going to come back to that event and we have pinned into the show tonight if you're interested or you're based in london or if you know someone who's based in london who's interested in you know nutrition health well-being um reducing teacher workload all those different things then definitely pass that link on to them i've pinned it to the space so maybe just save it in your inbox or wherever and then later on you can forward it on to anyone who you think might be interested in that now let's crack on charlie with my first batch of questions for you because i'm sure some of this will be covered at the event next month i'm guessing because you've got a nutritionist there um mm -hmm. who's one of your main speakers so i'm sure they'll be talking a little bit about um what we're going to discuss tonight but i wanted to ask you um first of all with teaching it is quite tough isn't it to be able to stay healthy because we know that you know you come home and you're knackered and you just want to eat and binge and watch whatever and eat pizza and switch off right what's your answer to that i mean what if you're that teacher who's stuck in that rut of most nights of the week you come in you go to bed and literally you're eating a burger on your pillow and then you just fall asleep <laughs> right what's what's your solution to that i'm, I'm laughing because i've definitely done that before yeah um, <laughs> and it felt so good like, yeah but yeah. what is the solution Honestly, if you are someone who is, you know, you're coming home, you are having takeaways more more often than not, or you're grabbing quick food, you're actually in a in quite a good position. And hear me out with this. You don't need to change as much as you think you need to change, but you do need to change it for longer than you think you do. So what I mean by that is actually you can start with the low hanging fruit. You can start by keeping your dinners the same and just adding in a couple of snacks from fruits and veggies. You can start by looking at just increasing your protein at your breakfast. Maybe you add in a bit more veg with your lunch. You don't sort of throw out your, your lifestyle in favor of, I don't know, a meal plan that you found on Google because it's never going to work. You, this needs to fit around you. This needs to be your approach. And, and often people are really sort of taken aback when I say you don't need to kind of start from scratch. People think, well, every time I do a diet, and a diet's a word that I don't get on very well with, Every time I do a diet, I need to clear out the cupboards. I need to get rid of it. The fact is, you've tried that probably from, you know, if this applies to you, you probably tried that 10 or more times in the past and it hasn't worked. So clearly doing it again isn't going to be any different. So what we need to do is we need to take your lifestyle as it is, your nutrition. And when we talk about diet, for me, you know, diet comes from dieta and then a few other sort of translations of it, uh, French and Latin and, and whatever. And that basically, once upon a time, meant a way of life, a way of living. So when I talk about diet with my clients, I don't talk about just food. I talk about getting up and go for a walk. I talk about your sleep. I talk about your stress management. All of that for me is your diet. And it's everything you consume. It's everything that comes in. So if you are in that place where you are just having, you know, takeaways and whatever, and you're just getting through to the end of each day and you're feeling sluggish, you're feeling really lethargic because of it, just start with the smallest possible change you could make. Because you're guaranteed to be successful if it's something like adding in an apple a day, you know, and you're you're much more you're much more likely to enjoy the process if you hate every second of it you're never going to stick to it and i want everyone who's listening to this to change their complete mindset around what you're doing you're not doing this for six weeks or until your next holiday or till christmas i want everyone to stretch their vision and be thinking about how do i want to live for the rest of my life i want people to be thinking about when they're 60 what kind of foods they want to eat what social occasions they want to go to don't just think about a short period really think about the life you want to live not just what's in your cupboards Super. Now, uh, coming on to what is in the cupboards for a second, and I know that's literally complete opposite to what you've just said, but <laughs> is, is, I mean, 
what are the big, what are the best things to eat and what are the worst things to eat if you want to A, be healthy or B, lose weight? Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm going to focus mainly on the healthy side of things. Um, I'll touch on weight loss very, very briefly. But in terms of health, quite a few, there's a few general sort of guidelines, not, not food rules, but general guidelines that anyone can follow for the most part, unless you obviously have a specific dietary requirement. Weight loss is a slightly different thing, which I'll, I'll come to in a sec. When it comes to being healthy, again, you need to enjoy it because we're talking about mental health and physical health. I would never wish, and I've been in this situation myself, and I would never wish someone to be so focused on their nutrition and their food that it then impacts on their mental health and their relationship mm. with food. I've, I've done that. I've been there. It's not a nice place to be. And I've also been the other end of the spectrum. Generally speaking, a few guidelines around being healthy. We all know fruits and veggies are great for us. But I don't think we realize quite how good they are for us. A few key roles of the fruits and veggies, and I know I'm going to bore people with this, but they are amazing. They, they genuinely are amazing. The first one is that they fill you up really great. So if you're someone who feels snacky, gets to three o'clock, you're reaching for the biscuits. If you've got low intakes of fruits and veggies at breakfast and lunch, all you've got to do is add a couple, you know, a couple of fruits um, at breakfast, a bit of salad, something with a bit of fiber in at lunchtime, and you're going to feel much fuller for much longer. Fiber is great. It, when you say when you say a bit of fiber, what mm-hmm. kind of things would you be thinking about there? So to keep it really, really simple, obviously not all fruits and veggies are high in fiber. But if you are eating a range of fruits and veggies, you're much more likely to be bolstering your food into uh, your fiber intake. But even things like oats, you know, and wholemeal bread, things like that, there are lots of different high fiber foods. I've got sort of lots. But of But is wholemeal is wholemeal bread bad because it's got carbs in? No, no, you, you le- you're leading me down a right rabbit hole here, Tom. <laughs> Great, this. this is like all answering all my questions I've ever had. Carry on, yeah, bread, no, wholemeal right. bread, carbs, so, carbs. Um, right, how I'm going to try and split this. Put, let's park the healthy thing for a sec. Let's talk about carbs. There's a huge demonizing um, of carbs that goes on in the health and fitness world. I mean, when you look at it, all you've got to do is look at the last 30 years um, or even 40 years. Most people listening to this will sort of have been in there early sort of um, teens, right through to sort of, you know, late 20s, if we talk about, you know, 40 year span, going all the way through. So everyone's got some kind of experience, this or their parents talking about it, do you know what I mean? Think about that chunk of time. So from, you know, 2020 all the way to sort of 1980. When you think about it, you've had fat demonised. Then suddenly it was all Atkins diet, low carb, high fat. Sugar's been demonised, carbs have been demonised. There's really no uh, evidence to suggest, and, I, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a nerd for going and reading studies and evidence and, and, and meta studies and all this kind of stuff, just because I find it fascinating. There's no conclusive ed- evidence to suggest that there's anything wrong with carbohydrates in your diet. In fact, some of the healthiest populations on the planet eat quite a lot of carbs. Now, the thing is, it's, about, it's not about the carbohydrates itself. It's about our overall diet. And this is where we can fall into these pitfalls where people get really stuck and really confused about food because we think about one thing in isolation. It's like it's a little bit like having a few your engines gone, your tires are flat, whatever. And you're just focusing on the seatbelt not being right. Right. You're missing the wood for the tree sort of thing. So it's all about the overall diet. Carbohydrates are great. Carbohydrates are a fuel source. Like I said, loads of them come with really, really good doses of fibre as well, but particularly when we're thinking about our, our veggies and things and sort of, you know, oats and, and things like that. Nothing wrong with carbs at all. You know, particularly if you're someone who's wanting to exercise, if you're not wanting to feel completely zapped and wiped and lethargic, please don't cut out carbs. Now, I'm going to contradict myself ever so slightly. There are some people who do run quite well on a low-carb, higher-fat diet. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with either one. It honestly is just your body. It really depends on what you feel good on. If someone is trying to shove low carb down your throat or low fat down your throat, they're probably going to try to be selling you a book, to be honest, Tom. People who, (laughs) honestly, people who will, people who say that there is a yes or a no with nutrition are probably trying to sell you something at the end, honestly, because the answer is, like I said at the start, It depends. It depends on the individual. It depends what they feel good on. This is why I work one-to-one with people. I don't do any group coaching with my clients because I wouldn't be able to give them the advice they need in a group setting. Honestly, carbs are brilliant. You know, try it out. That's all I can say is experiment. Go for a few days where you do eat minimal carbs and maybe, you know, some some higher fats. Go in for sort of oily fishes, nuts, um, oils. um, What else have we got? Avocados, nut butters, 
Um, I'm sure I've missed some some out there. You know, dairy things like things that are quite high fat. Go for those things and minimise some of the carbohydrate sources, and then see how you feel after a couple of weeks. Because it really is about how your body responds to those different things. Yeah, yeah, Honestly, absolutely. That's probably the, the shortest answer I can give. <laughs> yeah. So what? I mean, there must surely be though some nutritional no nos. Some some meals or foods that are just never going to be good for you. They're never going to do any good for you, even in small quantities. Is that true, or or do you think actually anything in small doses is okay? Uh, short answer: I'd probably agree with you, your, your second point that anything in small doses is okay. What I do yeah. with with my team, most of the people that I work with have struggled with their relationship with food in the past. They've tried all the swimming clubs, not going to name them. They've tried the diet where you eat. 800 calories and, and you know all these things that we see on Good Morning Britain and all this stuff. And oftentimes, they again, they come with someone trying to sell you something, they come with someone trying to sell you a book or whatever. But this really, really affects people's mental health more than we think it does. does. Honestly, the people that I speak to, I was speaking to some um, ladies at the moment who are sort of in their mid-30s and their parents put them in Slimming World at age sort of 14, 15, 16. And it's, you know, things like this, you know, real detrimental to, to, our, to our mental health and our relationship with food. So instead of what I call black and white thinking, so that is the idea that there is a good food and a bad food, that sugar is bad, you know, fat is great or whatever your sort of food yeah. rules are. Instead of those food rules of, you know, pigeonholing stuff because that's how the human brain works. However, we can't do that with food. What we talk about in the group is a spectrum. So in reality, pretty much everything in life goes from less optimal to more optimal. It's not good or it's not bad. It's just this spectrum, which means if you go home on a Friday night and you have your Domino's takeaway or you you do whatever, yeah, that food might be a little bit less optimal, let's say, for your nutrition. It's got fewer vitamins and minerals, makes you feel a bit sort of bunged up, a bit sort of stuffy, a bit lethargic, a bit, bit, you know, a bit gross afterwards, as those foods tend to digestively. The next morning, it doesn't mean that then Saturday, Sunday have to be a write-off and you have to say, I've been bad on Friday night, let's get rid of it. You know, let's just sort of, you know, f- forget about it, start again Monday. What it means is that you've made a few potentially less optimal choices for your nutrition. And all you need to do is move that needle towards more optimal. So maybe on the next morning, you have a high fruit and veggie breakfast and high protein. Maybe you do sort of minimize your carbs and your fats a little bit just to give your digestive system a bit of a break. Maybe you go for a long walk. So what we talk about is this spectrum and we call it spectrum thinking. Now, without trying to confuse you, what I want you to imagine is that when it comes to health, we've got different facets. So we've got our physical health, we've got our mental health, emotional health, even spiritual, financial, all these different parts of our health make up our, our, our whole body health. Every part of our health has a spectrum. So give you, give you a really practical example. If someone goes for a takeaway with friends, it is maybe less optimal for their physical health, but for their mental and emotional health, it's probably going to be more optimal. And it's probably going to be less optimal for their financial health, if we're honest. If you imagine stacking up these spectrums one on top of each other, we are all about the averages, Tom, right? It's all about the averages. Where do you average out over the course of the day, the week, the month? Because if you go and have a McDonald's on a Friday on payday, right, does that mean that you're an unhealthy person? No, you've you've had one McDonald's. Is McDonald's an unhealthy food? You can sort of debate this a little bit. Mm, is it the food that's unhealthy or is it our behaviors around that food that make Mm. it unhealthy because you know if you have it like i say every payday you have mcdonald's you know on your way home or whatever you gotta think is that really impacting my health and would it be less or more healthy to completely ban and restrict all foods and build these really big barriers around them from a mental perspective so in that's my very very long answer in short everything in moderation and it's probably the most boring answer i can give you because it's what we've all been told no no but honestly if you want to have some harry bows on a friday night i would encourage you to have some harry bows on a friday night because the chances are if you don't have some on a friday night and you call them a bad food you over restrict them in a week's time you're going to have the whole packet and you're going to beat yourself up you're going to try and guilt yourself into growth and you're going to feel 10 times worse not just physically but also mentally as well Got you. And and just to mention, I, I think I mentioned at the start of this kind of segment is that Kim, Kimberly Wilson is one mm. of the speakers at the event next month. Now, she's a nutritionist, author, psychologist. So I'm guessing she might be talking about some of this stuff as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I think Kimberly's uh, main topic is going to be how we eat. Uh, sorry, what we eat uh, affects how we think. 
Ooh. which is really really interesting really, really that interesting. is it that is interesting so that that's anyone who lives in london that's next month and you can actually see there's a pinned tweet in the space at the moment at the top so if you fancy going along kimberly wilson is one of the speakers she's a psychologist and nutritionist there are actually nine uh, speakers at the event so um lots of different elements of well-being being covered but it just so happens that that she is a a nutritionist so definitely worth checking that one out um okay charlie so with regards to i mean some of the diets i've seen so for example one of the things i looked into recently was um fasting Mm. and it's something i've seen a lot of people talking about on on social media a lot of teachers a lot of people in general you know this idea of having a eight hour window where you don't eat or a 16 hour window where you don't eat or even a 24 hour window where you don't eat every every few days or whatever what, what, i mean is that good for you i mean i don't know I, I i mean i've certainly seen a lot of positive stuff about it um i know elon musk is a big fan of it because i saw him tweeting about it the other the other i think it was last month i mean what's your what's your view on it i think if you use it and you understand what it actually does which exactly is exactly as you said it reduces your eating window so you can eat less right if you use it and you have no sort of false expectations from it, I think it's a really, really good tool. I always talk to clients about their toolbox. Again, there's no one diet. There's no one workout plan that is going to be better or worse. There's no such thing as a fat burning exercise or sit ups to burn belly fat and all this kind of stuff. All these things that we're sort of told, none of that exists. We just have different tools and different methods. The principles will always be the same, but it's about us finding what works for us, our lifestyle, our family life and putting those tools in our toolbox. So fasting can be a really, really great tool. So exactly as you said, it's basically restricting nutrition through time. It's time restriction. And this could be something like a 5-2 fast, where you have sort of five days of eating, I do a little uh, air quotes, you can't see me, a little uh, um, five days of eating normally, and then two days of fasting, or you could do them back to back or separately. Um, It could be the 16-8 fast, which is really, really popular, which again is essentially you can think of it as, have your first meal at 12 o'clock and then eat up until eight o'clock and then you don't, then you go to bed and then you don't eat. You basically just get breakfast. So that's, but is that, but that that goes, that kind of the the bit that confused me is that runs kind of parallel to, to the kind of grandmother's advice, isn't it? Of never miss your breakfast type thing. Yeah. But is that just a myth in terms of if you miss a particular meal, it's bad for you. Is that a myth, really? Yeah, yeah, a complete myth, complete myth. All you need to worry about, really, or not worry, all you need to consider is how you're sort of eating over the course of a day and, and, and the week. So you don't need to worry about one particular meal. If you're not a breakfast person, you don't need to be a breakfast person. If you're still getting enough fruits and veggies in, you're still getting enough protein in, you know, you're still not under-eating, you're not overeating. you know, you've got a good, broad, balanced diet with some foods that you enjoy, you can skip breakfast if you want to. The, the, the impact is really really negligible and it, there's um there's unbelievable amounts of studies and meta studies that sort of show this the one thing that i want to sort of warn people about when it comes to fasting there's a there is a myth involved and um, it's very very popularized in america and again people have written books about it and because people don a white coat and they've got doctor in front of their name people sort of you know they pay their 1999 mm-hmm. to buy this book and it's, and it's full of very sort of uh I don't have to put this politely, mis- misconstrued information, sort of a, yeah. a, a, a grain of evidence that's been blown up to promote a certain agenda. That's what a lot of nutrition science is based on. Um, for example, sweeteners being bad for us is based on a study where they gave rats essentially the equivalent of like bath tubs worth of these sweeteners. Um, so you've got Cecil Fame K and um, Aspartame were the main ones. And they literally gave them the equivalent of, of us sitting and in, in drinking bath tubs of these sweeteners. And these rats developed cancer. And so the wild, wild, wild sort of um, correlation was made, sorry, causation was, was made. And people now are scared of sweeteners because they think they're going to, you know, they're bad for you or whatever. In actual fact, you'd have to drink gallons and gallons and gallons of, of diet coke and stuff to get any of those negative effects so it's the same kind of thing you know there's a grain of truth to it and there's a bit of truth in these studies and they get really widely sort of blown out of proportion the big thing with fasting is that so there's something in the body called um autophagy you hear it pronounced in different ways to be sort of really, really simple with it just imagine it's like cellular cleansing it's like your body clearing out the body, yeah. getting rid of bad cells you know doing this kind of stuff just sort of an, an upkeep it's like it's like a body mot 
this always happens regardless whether you're fasting or not fasting. Because if it didn't, in all the populations that ate breakfast, they would all die. And obviously that doesn't, doesn't happen. No. There is some evidence to show that when we fast, that autophagy, that sort of cellular cleansing and you know, cleaning up of the body is slightly increased. But the, the, it's increased to such a small, minute amount that you'll never even notice it. You might live for like an extra month or something. And in my opinion, if you're a breakfast person, is 80 years without breakfast worth living an extra month? I'm not really sure I'd take that, that deal. But I, suppo- but I suppose you, the you, point, I suppose those people who are breakfast people, because I'd certainly say I am, I can't. If I don't eat something, as soon as I wake up, I, I just, I'm an awful, yeah, awful yeah. human being. But I could probably possibly miss lunch. So I suppose, in in a sense, if you're going to, you know, there's flexibility in the fasting windows with all these Absolutely. diet things, aren't there? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, you know, just to, you mentioned weight loss in the beginning, you know, that's obviously one small part of health for some people's journeys. Some people, you know, it's, it's not part of their health journey at all. Um, and again, it's a very, very individual thing. But when it comes to weight loss, I think we've all probably heard of the whole sort of calories in, calories out sort of thing. But what people, a lot of people don't realise that this is the, this is the first law of something called thermodynamics. And that law, which is the same level as, of law as gravity, so, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty embedded in science. Um, same, law, same level of law as, uh, as law of gravity. That law, first law of thermodynamics, basically says that we are a closed system and that we can't create or destroy energy. It just gets transferred. So getting rid of all the science basically means energy comes into your body. We either use it up to move. It gets turned into, obviously, sort of um, thermal energy, heat energy, all these different things, right? The energy comes in, it either gets used up or it gets stored as body fat. Now, if weight loss is a goal, you don't need to worry so much about carbohydrates or, you know, how many um, grams of whatever you're eating. It's more about the total amount of energy coming in, if it's exactly the same or if it's similar to the amount that you're using in the day. And when I say using, I mean by resting and digesting, moving your body and doing exercise. Yeah. If the energy coming in is the same as the energy going out, that's maintenance, body weight will maintain roughly the same if the energy coming in is more than the energy that your body's using so you're overeating then the body's going to say oh we've got all this you know it's like it's like, it's like a battery we've got all this spare energy what are we going to do with it right obviously a battery would explode we, we don't do that we store that energy in, in, our, in our fat cells and then if the energy coming in is less than the energy going out so basically you're under eating and you're doing it in a healthy way hopefully then you'll lose weight because basically the energy coming in is less than what you need. So the body's going to go, right, I need, I need to now get energy from somewhere else. What have we got available? Oh, cool. We've got this stored energy that we, that we saved from later on. And then we go and tap into that and we, we lose body fat, which is what we're talking about when we yeah. lose body weight. But what about, what about, so does that, when you say energy, does that tie into calorie counting? Yes. Is that, is that basically what that's about? Yeah. So because the, the, my, my question to you would be is, you know, we mentioned about wholemeal bread, for example, earlier, a mm. single slice of wholemeal bread might be 100 calories. Mm. Right. So whereas, I don't know, a whole packet of um, tomatoes might be, I don't know, less, you know, yeah. you could eat like cuc- a whole cucumber or something. That sounds really dodgy, but a whole cucumber. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. And, and actually that could be less. So my point is, what what you know? Surely that does matter with regards to carbs. If you're calorie counting, or do, or is it just a case of mix it up and and you, because for me, I I usually can last longer without eating if I if I eat say beans on toast for lunch, mm. right? And I've tried to I had a bit of an argument with someone actually a bit ago about this. I tried to I tried to suggest, which is true. That some Premier League footballers, like I think it was Jesse Lingard and someone, I can't remember who it was actually, said they said about eating beans on toast mm. um, for lunch. And I thought, what? Premier League footballers? Um, but I'm guessing that's to do with the carbs and to do with the fact they've been training all morning and they can get away with it. I mean, Mal- Michael Phelps is a good, good example, isn't it? I mean, he was a notorious one for stuffing his face with burgers and whatever. But, <laughs> you know, his body was like Charlie Burley's. <laughs> not at the moment <laughs> back in back in the triathlon days maybe um, yeah but no 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 you make a really good point i think to be honest when we're talking about the calories when i was talking about energy that is that is calories you know the the um unit of of measure of of energy is of food energy is calories or, or kil- kilocalories to be more specific and one calorie is the amount of energy it takes up 
to uh, takes to heat up one gram of water by one degree. That's how they measure a um, kilocalorie. If you want a, a fact to sort of really under underwhelm people at a dinner party with, uh, calories came from uh, sort of locomotives and stuff. And discovering, you know, this unit of measure came from is linked to trains. Again, very underwhelming uh, fact there that you might want to share with someone or you, you might not want to. But um, that's kind of what it is. So one calorie is the energy it takes to heat up one gram of water by one degree. Um, and all everything contains calories. You know, we, we cannot escape it. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to count calories. But if, you know, I always use the rule, what gets measured gets managed. So if you don't have any awareness around calories, it might be useful for you to use the tool of calorie counting. So you build up a better awareness of, you know, yeah, cool. There's 120 calories in a thick slice of bread. And I can also get 120 calories from, you know, half a tablespoon of peanut butter. And it's not about restricting these foods. It's about just building up your awareness because, you know, this is a teacher talking. We're not really taught this kind of stuff in school. And these are life skills that you know lots of us haven't really developed. I know that I think it's year one, they have sort of a bit of a science unit on this, and maybe year four or five, I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, but we're not, we're kind of taught the eat well plate, which again isn't really great because protein's tiny on that plate. And we're yeah. sort of taught the food pyramid, and we're taught kind of taught a few things, but again, we're, it's not really clear, and we're not really sort of fully, fully immersed in, in what we need to know. And more importantly, in eating behaviors and eating skills which is a different thing entirely. Most people don't chew their food enough. Most people don't have a drink of water with their food. Most people don't put their knife and fork down between bites. All these little things that we're not really taught. Um, and, and, and you, Tom, are part of the same generation as me. I was always told, clear your plate. Do not leave a scrap on your plate because otherwise you're ungrateful and it seems rude. That's what I was taught. Even when my dad you know, came back from a long day and he'd had a, a beef casserole in the slow cooker for 12 hours and the, the carrots were <laughs> brown and all that horrible stuff, you know, had to eat everything and we loads of people come from this generation um and their parents and their parents come from a generation where you had to clear your plate yeah so all, all these things come in i know i'm going off on a tangent here but all these things come into no, play. No. in terms of the you sort of you linked it back to carbs yeah you're absolutely right you need in my opinion everyone could do with building awareness around what is in food but like i said before i would really rather everyone enjoyed their diet enjoyed their life you know nobody wants to live to be a certain scale uh weight on the scale yeah. you know and and to be honest the measuring scales are a terrible way to measure health and a terrible way to measure even weight loss progress um because they don't show you your body fat they show you all sorts of different stuff which is a topic for another day but i'd really really implore people to in, eat what they enjoy moderate the things that we know we need to moderate you know you, you could ask anyone to to put on a graph what is what's healthy food uh, what's healthful food and what's less health healthful food and we can all do it right we know what we need to moderate we know what we can eat in abundance it's it's about us looking at our behaviors and our mindsets around food rather than the knowledge of what to and what what to eat in abundance and what to minimize it's much more about the behaviors that we have around those foods yes i mean i'm just looking at and my worst enemy is sweets if i could eat a whole packet of sweets every day I would buzz off it. And actually, I used to. I mean, if I go back to kind of like in my 20s, I would, and not, not every day, but I would quite happily smash through a full bag of Haribo whenever, easily, you know, after, after school, after work, oh, I'll get a bag of Haribo. And I'll eat my way through it in like five minutes, a uh, bag of whatever. And then in the last few years, um, I think COVID um, wrecked me because I think I just spent too long sat on my bum Mm. Um, and that wrecked me and then I've never really recovered from that um, so uh, I I kind of um, started to, to look into calories and one, one of the things that shocked me was an M&S, you know M&S Colin the Caterpillars yeah, yeah they are literally like awful <laughs> like awful awful things i couldn't i couldn't believe it um i mean per per sweet so if you have one call in the pack caterpillar one <laughs> you know one of those slithery little beautiful things yeah that's 50 calories mm. can you believe that yes yeah that's they're, they're that's that's the equivalent of eating half a slice of bread in one call in the caterpillar and I would quite happily sit there. And in fact, some slices of bread are like 70 calories. 
So actually, it'd probably be more than half. It'd be the equivalent of sitting there and eating like 10 slices of bread or something. <laughs> eating one packet of, of Colin the Cannibal. Because there's not actually that many sweets in a packet. Sorry, yeah. I could talk about this all day, Charlie. No, but, honestly, um... honestly I, I could, I could, round, I could ramble about this all day. I really, really could, and and you know, we can sort of really unpick carbs and calories and metabolic rates and all this kind of stuff. But to be honest, most of the science in this area is still pretty understudied in terms mm. of the. Like I said, you'll find a grain of truth from one study. Someone will see a, a, a marketing opportunity, and they and it will be exaggerated. You know, unfortunately, nutritional science isn't isn't particularly a popular sort of field of science. Um, so that you know, there is still there is still a lot of unknowns, absolutely. And I think for me, when I work with clients, it is more about their relationship with the food, like I said, their mindset of food and their behaviours around food, because most of us don't have those skills. So if you've got someone who has quite a poor relationship with food, you know, they their eating skills and their behaviours around food aren't great. And you're telling them, well, what's your metabolic rate? How many calories have you burned on your five minute walk? What's your Fitbit saying? You know, check your heart rate, check this, you know, how many grams of fibre have you had like to, to, to the T? That person just needs to look at their behaviours and their mindset around food. They don't need to worry yeah. about about the, the calories and the metabolic rate and all this malarkey. That's not what they need. This person needs help with the psychological side rather than the nutrition side. And I think that gets lost on a lot of people. You know, yeah. it's, it's quite easy to, to, to talk in terms of like I've just done in terms of facts and numbers and this and that, because it's, it's, you know, it's quite a tangible thing for some people. The psychological, not quite so easy to tackle. It's not, yeah. it's, it's not the field that lots of people want to talk about because you know, it's uncomfortable and it's quite a personal thing for a lot of people. But honestly, that's where most change needs to happen with people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Giselle has messaged in saying, one of the courses we're offering in our academy is the science behind nutrition. I'm excited to use this information and create discussion questions for our kids so they can start thinking about their health early on. Fantastic. Um, well, let's. I want to move on to exercise in a minute. Charlie. But before we do that, I should remind everyone that if you want to message in a question or a comment, then just hit a the tweet button on your Twitter and use the hashtag TT Radio and just post a question. Maybe tag in TT Radio as well if you want at TT Radio 2022 and we will pose that question to Charlie. Alternatively, you can push the little button on the bottom left that says request to speak if you're brave enough. Of course you are. And you can ask Charlie a question in person and we can discuss it on the show so if you want to do either of those things then feel free to do so um also a reminder that in our kind of pinned uh tweets at the stop uh, at the stop at the top of the space we've got um a uh a and uh, we've got information about the event you're running next month charlie which Mm -hmm. is in london it's at the etc venues uh, in central London, and it looks absolutely phenomenal. You've got nine speakers. The event title is Rewriting Wellbeing. Uh, you've got Kimberly Wilson, who's a nutritionist. Um, uh, Andrew Cowley, who some people may know, um, very well known on, on the topic of well-being, teacher well-being in particular. Uh, Jem Foster, um, uh, who is, well, I think she's she's a very significant figure on Instagram, actually could be wrong mm-hmm. there. I think she is. Um, so you've got lots of really interesting um, kind of speakers there. If you want to go along, just explore it by clicking on the tweet at the top of the space and you can explore it in more detail and have a look at the tickets that are on offer uh, for next month. So Charlie, let's move on to well being. And, and particularly I want to talk in this next bit about exercise. So, With regards to exercise, is it, I mean, what is your kind of like baseline, your essential exercise that you think someone has to do to be healthy? Is it the NHS, you know, 30 minutes uh, walking a day type thing? I mean, what's your like thing? Because presumably some people could do yoga every day and be really fit and agile and whatever and, and not necessarily do I don't know, 30 and an hour of steps. I mean, I'm talking here as a complete novice. I'm asking you. Yeah. No, 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 it's absolutely fine. So in terms of what people know, people know sort of the, um, let's like say, 30 minutes of exercise um, and the whole sort of idea of getting your 10,000 steps in. Now, the whole 10,000 steps thing actually came from the 30 minutes of exercise. So what they did is they worked out that 
if the average person with your, your typical sort of day job then went and did 30 minutes of movement so not really sort of strength based or, or weight based um movement but like you know walking running whatever that their their daily steps would be something like 10,000 steps so that's where the 10,000 steps thing came from it came from that 30 minutes of movement now for me with teachers and busy hectic lives obviously the, the bottom line is always going to be do something that you enjoy now it doesn't mean that you're going to enjoy getting up in december to do it <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're going to enjoy every single second but like i said in the very very beginning if you don't enjoy the process you're never going to stick to the goal it doesn't matter what the most optimal exercise is it doesn't matter you know what what your your pt is telling you if you if you have a pt for example and you hate it it's not going to work out long term, is it? So you've got to find something that you that you do genuinely enjoy. Now, with my clients, what we tend to start off with is just looking at increasing the general movement. So we don't talk at all about exercise because for a lot of people, exercise drums up these. For me, it drums up horrible memories of freezing, completely freezing um, outside secondary school PE. I've never been very sporty, to be honest. Um you know, not picked for the first team, standing there, freezing cold, getting a rugby ball thrown at my head when mm. I'm shivering. That's what exercise drums up for me. Running yeah. laps, running laps in the cold, um, doing the bleak test. You know, really horrible memories. Or it drums up memories of me, of, of my mum talking to me about these two clubs that she used to go to. She used to go to something called Fat Club, which was essentially slimming, like a slimming club. And she used to go to Keep Fit. And she hated both. And she never stuck to either. So mm-hmm. that's kind of when I, when someone talks to me about exercise, it drums up these horrible feelings of something that I don't want to do. So we talk about movement and training. Movement is your general general day to day activity. It could be park again. Steps is a good way to think about it, but it could be parking further away from the front of the shop just so you've got to walk a little bit further. It might be you know leaving the basket, the washing basket at the bottom of the stairs, so you've got to go up and down the stairs a couple of times. Just different ways to increase your movement. If you've got a phone call. Do you sit on the sofa or do you, you know, go for a quick walk around the garden whilst you whilst you're Well, I was going to ask you actually. So, sorry to cut across, but standing is mm-hmm. that a good thing to have standing desks and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I have, I'm standing at my my standing desk right now. The only reason really that I get it is because I I get very tired when I'm sitting down for a long period of time. Which nowadays I, I do a lot of laptop work. Um, and back pain for me it helps me be less hunched over. So there's yeah. a couple of sort of physical benefits to it. In terms of sort of general health, you know, you, yeah, you can link it all in together. If you're sat there and you're someone who's got very rounded shoulders, you might get neck, uh, neck pain, you know, tension, all these other sort of bits and bobs that come from sitting. So standing desks, yeah, I, I guess has a sort of link there as well. Yeah, yeah, because I, I read something about it. It actually counts towards your, you know, your uh, kind of exercises. It's just standing, you know, a standing desk type thing. If you're standing instead of sitting, it's it's better for your actual yeah I I, I think, I think, yeah yeah I, I you know when when i'm not on calls and i'm just sort of typing away or i'm creating something for you know social media i'll have my music on and i'll have a bit of bit of a dance and whatever so i you know i guess you do have a bit of, bit of movement i know you can get those under desk treadmills that you can walk on yeah. and all these other things but you know yeah, yeah I, I guess you do it's, it's just about how much you move and you know if if you're someone who ever does have has done a very restrictive diet yeah. you'll see how the body adapts to a very restricted diet because like i said you've got su- such a small amount of calories coming in you will fidget less you want to sit down more you'll feel tired more tired whereas if you have got a good broad balanced diet you're getting enough food in you're going to feel like a bit you know, a bit more bouncy you, you're going to want to dance when the music comes on you're going to want to sort of fidget a bit more and there's quite a lot of sort of studies that show that correlation with you know lower calorie diets and f- basically fidgeting less and um, so in terms of the movement go back to that for a lot of the team, I noticed that particularly if they're a bit of a sit down teacher um, and I've, I, you know, when I went through my career, I was, I think I was probably every teacher under the sun. But mm. if you are a bit of a sit down teacher who does like to sit and teach from their desk and you're trying to increase your movement, the easiest thing I can say is, is just stand up to teach and you'll find yourself sort of, um, I want to say gesticulating, but I don't know if that's the right word. Is, is that the right word? Moving your hand? Yeah, probably. Is that, yeah, yeah. Um, don't really use that word very often. No. So, yeah, you know, you find yourself sort of, you know, gesticulating, talking a bit more with your hands. You find yourself pacing in front of the board. You know, now sort of we, we're able to move around our classrooms again fully. You know, you're, you're walking around the classrooms, going to different groups. If you are a standing teacher, you are going to just generally move a lot more. 
you know you'll notice things like you do have, get a bit a little bit less back pain you will feel like you've actually got a bit more energy because you are moving around you, your blood is pumping the oxygen is going around your body so just standing more there's a couple of things that you can do in the classroom that are sort of um or in school that are really useful i used to lo- be a really big kind of daily mile so there was a big initiative and there's a few similar ones but essentially it was take the children out playground that, e- that equal a mile and i think it was sort of like 20 minutes of walking or so of course it depends on your class depends on the day all that kind of stuff maybe you could split it up into two chunks of 10 minutes throughout the day little things like that though they get a brain break they get some movement in just remember this this isn't just about us they will benefit from all this kind of stuff because again daylight is important for that circadian rhythm daylight getting it in your eyes making sure that you your body knows what time of day it is right if it's 11 o'clock in the morning your body doesn't really want to feel tired but if you're in a dark room or you've got sort of loads of artificial lighting this is particularly difficult in the winter you're not going to feel very awake you know if you're in a stuffy classroom open the windows go outside get some daylight in get your body moving get your blood pumping we all we, this is all stuff we all know but if you can find ways to fit it into your day it doesn't need to become this extra thing on top of it that then you don't have time for you can make yeah. time for it in the day that's a big one just moving more taking the long way around the school to the photocopier going for a walk on your lunch break, even if, even if it's five minutes. And this is the other thing that I think Tom would apply to a lot of what we're going to talk about today. We, like I said, we underest- sorry, we overestimate how much we need to do and we underestimate how long we need to do it for. So to give okay. you an example in this, if someone was to go for a five minute walk at lunchtime and they did that five days a week, that's an extra, th- almost an extra, th- uh, an extra 30 minutes of movement they're doing every single week. Times yeah. that by 52 hours upon hours of extra movement a year and all they've done is a five minute lunchtime yeah walk. yeah do you see what i mean so but as you say i suppose it's keeping that consistency isn't it because yeah. if it's if it's racketing down with rain outside mm. or what or you're having a bad day i yeah. just want to sit and eat a whole bag of haribo on my own absolutely yeah um, somewhere yeah. in a corner yeah 100 percent. yeah go 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 to, go to your little um i used to have my cupboard go and stand in your cupboard and, and sort of get, get some peace. Yeah. You know. But I know what you mean, though. I know exactly what you mean. It's, it's it, it, that kind of incremental consistency. Yeah. I mean, in terms of, I was going to ask you actually, run, so in terms of movement and exercise, you mentioned that kind of differentiation between those, those two things. Mm-hmm. I mean, what is better? Is it better to do light walking, say, for a long period of time as opposed to, say, a five or ten minute strenuous, you know, like you've got things like the seven minute workouts, stuff like that. Is it better to, what's better? Is it better to do, if you're going to do, I don't know, a big gym, gym session every week, but then not move much the rest of the time, is it actually better to do your kind of daily walking routine, something kind of relatively easy for you to do? You know, all, all the things that are better and worse when it comes to exercise and routines. I think for that one, Tom, you'd have to think better for what? Yeah. Because it's it's very much outcome dependent, isn't it? You know, if someone just wants to sort of move a little bit more, um, you know, for aches and pains, just, you know, maybe increase your activity for, you know, to increase the amount of calories they're burning or whatever it is, a, a, a long, gentle walk might be relaxing for them. It might sort of benefit their mental health. They can listen to a podcast, listen to music, you know, or if they are a busy mum of two and they've literally got 10 minutes, then they might choose a quick hit workout or, or a 10 minute run or something. So it's really, really hard because it depends on the person, their lifestyle, and it depends on what their goal is. Do you know what, do you know what we were saying? Do you know what we were talking earlier about calories and calorie counting? And then obviously exercise ties into that. Mm. Would you say that if someone was doing, I don't know, a 30 minute, 20 minute run every day or five days a week or something, does that kind of, because I remember Ed Sheeran, sorry I keep mentioning all these random celebrities, <laughs> on there. I like, but I did hear Ed Sheeran was saying quite famously that he just runs nearly every day for whatever it is, 20, 30 minutes, and then eats whatever he wants. Now, I'm not saying Ed Sheeran looks like, you know, Michael Phelps, who I was talking about earlier, but, you know, he was saying that's, it, that's good enough for him. It stops him from getting big. You know, he's just kind of like uh, runs every day but then eats whatever he wants. Because presume, obviously when you run, you're burning a lot of calories off. So do you, do you, does that, does that strength, should that strenuous exercise build into your calorie counting? Should you give yourself a bit more of a free pass 
if you do the exercise or does it not work like that? No, it absolutely does work like that. So essentially, there, there's sort of four main ways. I'm going to probably, probably got that wrong, probably three main ways. Let me try and count them out uh, that, that our body uses energy. So like I said earlier, it's the, the resting and digesting. So that is your BMR, your basal metabolic rate. So basically, if you imagine, Tom, if you lay down all day, you would burn those calories just through your brain, digestion, all that stuff. That's your BMR. Yeah. Then you've got what we call your, um, your NEAT. So this basically means non-exercise activity. So walking, yep. basically walking, fidgeting, standing up, stand, sitting down. So you've got what you eat, what you burn at rest, what you burn just moving about. Then the next biggest one is what you burn digesting your food. So this is called the thermic effect of food, basically digesting your food sort of thing um, and actually processing the food. So it's strange, but the energy in your food, some of that is used to actually just to break it down and to process it and then the smallest part for most this is the average this is people like me and you tom just normal everyday people the smallest part of that is your exercise activity so when you look at it that way 70 percent of what your body uses calorie wise is just by just your, your basal metabolic rate just by existing and then for the average person it's about five percent is on exercise right so that's that's yeah. important to sort of bear in mind but the two main levers that we can pull when it comes to, to weight loss, and this isn't all about health, this is just weight loss. The two main levers we can look at are your nutrition and your exercise. We, yeah. we, all, we, we all know that. So with Ed Sheeran, he, he's left his nutrition, you know, still. He's, he's left it as how it was. And yes. he's, sort of, he's sort of focused on just exercising more. So what he's done is, you know, if it's keeping him, his body fat levels the same, it's keeping him you know, at the same sort of... Um, Yes. nutrition stayed the same but he's exercising more so he's created that so he's got himself back down to calorie maintenance through exercise so the answer the short answer is yes you can absolutely do it that way but then you've got to look look at health as a separate thing yes and there's two there's two ways you can either three ways you can look at it just from the health angle from the health uh, health and weight maintenance or just the weight maintenance and you know for most people i work with it's that middle one it's Am I being healthy first and foremost, mentally and physically? And then if weight is part of my journey, what's my weight doing? But again, for, for some people, weight isn't part of their journey whatsoever. And it's just about health, longevity, that kind of stuff. Yeah, because just reading now, I mean, 30 minute run, you're guaranteed to burn between 200 and 500 calories, depending on how fast you're going. I mean, even a, even a jog, I'm guessing, would probably get you to 300, 250, 300 calories for 30 minutes of, of running. So it's, it's a lot of calories <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. To, to be able to burn off if you consider that, um, especially if you're just going at like a gentle pace. I mean, if you, if you had a, a client or someone else who you were talking to and, you, you know, they were starting to say, oh, I'm really struggling with my, my, with my weight and my health in general would you start with the nutrition or would you start with the exercise or would you just be like well what do you prefer to start with nutrition always nutrition because more often than not we start with exercise and the thing is you know you just said there about like the the, the calorie range for, for running it is it is impossible near on impossible we'd have to get you into a lab we'd have to put all these things on you we'd have to get the lasers involved we'd have to put a mask on you to measure your co2 output we, we'd have to do so many tests to figure out how many calories you're burning yeah when you, when you jump on the treadmill and it says you've burnt 300 calories ignore it, you, it it's wildly inaccurate it, it doesn't know your height your weight your, yeah your it when you when you use your apple watch your fitbit anything that tells you your calories it you've got to give it the you've got to sort of look at it with a pinch of salt because it's wildly inaccurate wildly wildly inaccurate even if you put in like your gender and your height and stuff even then those kind kind of devices are still inaccurate so for me personally particularly as i work with some people who have over exercised in the past or they get really sort of caught up on how, oh, how many calories have i burned you know or yeah. how many steps have i done some people can get really sort of obsessed with that and so that's the opposite of what we want we want this to become a natural lifestyle so we start by looking at nutrition and just increasing movement just slowly usually through a couple of walks or steps or something like that across the week and then we look at training so training is different to exercise exercise for most people is exactly what you said you know it's about burning calories and just you know not not putting on body fat that's what it is for most people and for most people that doesn't make them happy and it doesn't complement their life it actually sort of contradicts it a little bit so what we do is we look at training 
training is something that's purposeful it's positive it's progressive training means that you set yourself a goal and you build in levels to get there it, it gamifies it a little bit becomes yes. a game and you really enjoy the process for example if someone wants to get stronger doing hit workouts is probably not going to build strength going and doing re- resistance training with bands or weights or body weight or something like that is going to build strength muscular strength and you can set someone right this week you're going to lift six kilos okay two weeks time let's try and lift eight kilos and it becomes this positive game and you try and beat you try and beat your prs you're not going there to make yourself a smaller person you're not going there to hit a number on scales you're not going there to burn calories you're going there to build to get stronger to get fitter to get faster and honestly the, the 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 benefits to someone's mental approach when they're thinking about movement and training instead of exercise and calories is is transformative it really yes. is yes absolutely i mean uh, well just before we move on to the next question if you're interested in this sort of stuff and you're based in the southeast slash london area check out the pinned tweet at the top of this space just scroll up to the top and there's a pinned tweet in there and it says um have you uh, heard of the upcoming uh rewriting well-being event which is next month it's in london it's on the 22nd of October. It's next month. Don't miss it. Uh, it's at the ETC venues in London. You can find it on Eventbrite by just searching Rewriting Wellbeing. Charlie himself will be there, along with nine other expert speakers, and also lots of his ambassadors will be there too. So it, it sounds, and the venue, I've seen the venue, and it is literally like the Rolls Royce of, of venues. So it's absolutely <laughs> amazing. Um, so don't miss it. Check it out. Click that Eventbrite link on the on the tweet there, Charlie. The, in terms of the well being element of things, mm. um, I mean, with regards to to kind of going to the gym or getting a personal trainer, I mean, do you think that the getting of a personal trainer is that is that more about discipline? You know, I've often wondered this. Is this more about oh, I've got a person, I've got someone to hold me accountable? for my actions you know rather yeah. than i mean is is and is that part of it or i mean what what are the kind of pros and cons of getting a personal trainer yeah absolutely i think you hit the nail on the head there for, for a lot of people it is a bit skin in the game isn't it you know it's I've, I've made this investment i've bought 10 sessions up front or whatever i've then got that person to give me accountability the, the thing is and again this isn't to be on personal trainers at all um you know I've got lots of friends that are personal trainers. A lot of personal trainers are starting to move online. And the reason that they're doing it, which sounds a bit crazy for a personal trainer, but the reason that they're doing it is because then they can be there to support their clients around the clock. When you, yeah. think, about, when you think about what do I need, if anyone's here thinking, do I get a personal trainer? Do I get a nutrition coach? You know, how do I invest in myself? Do I go to a club? If anyone's having that conversation, think about what areas it, areas that you really struggle with, not what areas you think you need to change or what areas everyone else around you is changing. Think about what you really, really need because most people, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to rub any personal trainers up the wrong way. But <laughs> a, lo- a lot of people, not everyone, a lot of people don't need a personal trainer. They need a coach and someone who isn't just going to be there for a one hour twice a week, but someone that they can drop in on and who's going to drop in on them have a check-in with them, yes. hold them to account. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the, the big part of a personal training is sometimes the knowledge of exercise yes. and, and training. And the big part is the accountability. And you need to really think, what do I need? Is it that I don't know how to exercise? Is it really that? Or is it that I need, I don't know, emotional support, mental support? Do I need accountability? Do I need a community of like-minded people? Do I need some knowledge around eating skills and my relationship with food because for most people that i work with it's not the fact that they don't go to the gym it's some of these other areas yeah absolutely and and i suppose it depends what your goals are as well doesn't it yeah so, yeah of course do yeah. you want to get ripped and i mean i was going to ask you actually about six packs charlie and getting <laughs> ripped i know nathan gins here in the space he's an expert on this topic but six packs getting ripped uh, mm-hmm. looking you know you, you, your chest looks like something out of you know a builder's yard kind of been sanded <laughs> it's beautiful i mean how do people how do you if someone wanted a six pack and obviously we all do joke um but if we did <laughs> how do you how you must have to literally i mean the commitment that people must go through to get 
Those yeah. kind of really yeah. chiselled. Like your body, Charlie. Really chiselled. Um, not, not at the moment, Tom. Not at the moment. No, honestly, you know, jokes aside, I'll, I'll kind of tell you a really quick story. That was, a, <laughs> By the way, that was a giant bottle of Diet Coke just opening now. So apologies. Yeah. Um, aspartame is about to run through my system. So just carry make, on. As long as it's left, less than a bathtub for you. You're Can good. you hear you're that? Good. Yeah. <laughs> that is absolute... Make oh. me thirsty. Carry on, sorry, six packs. That's all right. Go no, on. honestly, six packs. Um, if anyone, male, female, who who is wanting to get a six pack, it is literally having low enough body fat so that you can see your abs. Everyone's got abs. Some people's are bigger than others. Depends on sort of you know lots of different factors. Genetics being being a massive part of it. All you need to do is to get very, 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 very low body fat. Now, um, I won't go too into it, but I I did that once. When I say once, I mean I mean once. Because it was dreadful. So this was probably about three, three and a half, maybe even four years ago now, Tom. And it was way, I was still teaching full time. I was teaching year six at the time, actually. Yeah. And I just, I think I just, sort of, it must be about three, four years ago. So I just started my qualification as a nutritionist. And I got some advice from a PT, funnily enough. And they said, right, what you need to do is you need to get ripped, right? Bearing in mind that... <laughs> Bearing in mind the clients I work with, I've never worked with a client who's ever asked me about a six pack ever. But this person... well, you have now because I've just asked you about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Um, <laughs> Not that the yeah, client, but anyway, carry on. <laughs> yeah, and he, he said, you know, get six pack. So I went on a unbelievably restricted diet for twelve um, twelve weeks, and this is where a lot of my sort of empathy with people who have tried restrictive things comes from. I was miserable, absolutely miserable. Yeah. To the point where, and this can happen if you really over restrict, the your your body doesn't prioritize your facial muscles, and this doesn't get spoken about enough. Oh if my you go God. on an extremely an extreme crash diet, right? Thinking about sort of lots of models in kind of the nineties and the noughties, you have that sort of gaunt yeah, like face. a Kate Moss style. Yeah, you have that gaunt face, and it's because actually some you have such little energy in your body that you it will it will, won't prioritize the contraction of some of your facial muscles, so you get this real gaunt look. Oh, even you know, even more so than just because there's not enough fat on your on your face basically that um again without going into too much detail i didn't didn't have a libido for six weeks um to the point where it became alarming because you know it makes sense biologically if you don't have enough energy coming in what's the point right um and things like that things like a terrible relationship with food like absolutely horrendous relationship with food i was binge eating um I, I definitely yeah. had um, disordered eating tendencies. Not now that that's very different to an eating disorder. Very, very different. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a diagnosed thing. Disordered eating tendencies are the behaviours that might pr- be a precursor. But I, I got to that point, which is you know very, very difficult. Did I get abs? Absolutely. I've got about hundred horrible photos of me oiled up. I'm 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 I'm, I'm honestly ashamed to say, Tom. I'm I'm very embarrassed. They never they never see the light of day. In fact, I don't even know if I've got them anymore. They where are... can where can women and me find the pictures <laughs> of you all oiled up? I'm not. Con- they are they are actually online somewhere, but I'm not going to tell you where. <laughs> it was, um, if you scroll back to 2019, you might find some. But um, yeah, you know, brilliant. I'll, I'll, hang on, I'm just just on Google. No, don't, don't do it. Don't do it. No, Charlie I'm, oiled. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, I, okay, I mean, it's interesting the whole because there is this obsession. I mean, I was going to ask you really about the whole mental health implications because it's not just young people; it's anybody. This whole idea of trying to look like something out of Love Island, you know. I know exactly. Genevieve's here; she's a massive Love Island fan. We got a lot of Love Island fans here, but that kind of whole thing of trying to look like someone out of Love Island. Mm. It, uh, you know that ov- obviously is affecting people in a, in a in in some cases in a negative way. I mean, but obviously in other people maybe in a positive way. I mean, I mean, yeah. is is does it matter why you're trying to look like that? Does that matter? Because if you're doing it to be as healthy as you possibly can be, is mm. that better than doing it so you can look like Charlie Burley? <laughs> Again, I'm going to say again, not right now. I, it's been a while. It's been a while. Um, 
No, Lucy so... wants to speak. I'm guessing she's found pictures of you oiled. Lucy? Oh, oh, I really hope not. I shouldn't have mentioned that. Guttingly, I haven't. But what I was going to say about the, the Love Island thing, it just reminded me of something. My colleague refers to the men on Love Island as glistening hams. And now that I put that all in, <laughs> in all of your heads, you will never unsee it. They're glistening <laughs> hams. Thank that is a that. very good description. Brilliant. Um, well, OK, so we talked about, you know, we talked about nutrition. By the way, everybody, this is going to be available as a podcast. So you're going to be able to download it from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all these other places, probably an hour or two after we finish here. Um, so if you're listening to this on Catch Up, then you can just click the link in the show notes and it will take you to the Rewriting Wellbeing event and to find out more about that. But it'll also take you to a little bit more information about what we've been talking about today. But so far, we've talked about nutrition. We've talked a little bit about um, fitness and exercise. I wanted to ask you about sleep, Charlie, mm-hmm. because this is a huge issue for teachers. It's a huge issue, I, I think. Yeah. I haven't surveyed them, but I, I should probably do a Twitter poll or something. But... What they always talk about eight hours, don't they? Eight hours sleep. How important is sleep, though? Really? Um, it's not an answer that anyone wants to hear, but it's unbelievably important. Unbelievably. And there's a quote, and I'm going to say it. Do I, do I need to give um, credit on here because I can't remember who said it? Or can I just say the quote? Don't worry. Go for I'll it. Put, I'll put it out there. I, I do. It, it's a. Uh, I can't remember who it is. Anyway, I'll, I'll say well, don't worry. We can reference them later. Don't worry. Yeah, essentially, it's, it's you know, it's not it's not that exciting. But essentially, uh, the quote was: "Sleep is the golden chain that bu- that binds our health together." That's that's the quote, and I use it quite a lot because it really, yeah. really is. Just to give you a few things, you know, even if you get one poor night's sleep, your your cognitive function goes down drastically, something like thirty percent or something. If you get a couple of nights really, really poor sleep, the hormone that makes you feel hungry or one of the hormones called ghrelin, that is increased. So your hunger hormone goes up. So that's why when you're tired, you're hungry and snacky. Um, And the hormone that makes you feel full, or one of them called leptin, that decreases. So when you have a really rubbish night's sleep, you're hungrier and you need more food to get the same sort of satiation. So that's why people get, you know, hangry and snacky when they're hungry that's just two tiny tiny things there are so many things it compromises your immune system all sorts of stuff so when i talk to so many you know so many teachers who are working till nine o'clock at night they're on their screens we all know that screen yeah. time isn't great before bed then they are trying to go to sleep it's literally been less than half an hour between thinking about looking at work and trying to go to sleep of course they're going to have a really busy mind they're going to have thoughts racing around they've probably been on their laptop in bed or on the sofa let's be mm. honest and mm. i did i did this for years and years and years it's not a criticism it's just just no, no. what teachers do the thing is we need if we if there's anything that we're going to set boundaries with it needs to be sleep now there's a couple of things that we can do the the main one is cutting down your screen time before bed because within the spectrum of light that comes out of our, that our screens and it comes out of the screens there is blue light and blue light has been shown to negatively impact uh, melatonin which is the main sort of sleep, sleep yeah. um, um, hormone and when that usually most people melatonin that sleepy feeling um, will or that causes that sleepy feeling that will peak at sort of 9 to 11 p.m for most people yeah. if you're on your phone scrolling tiktok looking at cats playing piano you are then not going to be getting yourself into that same state as, as you want to. So that's the big one. The second thing is going to be making sure your bedroom environment is calm, it's cool, it's got dim lighting, it's just a really restful place. The best, the best way to summarise all this advice is imagine that you're, you, you are living 5,000 years ago and you're sleeping in a cave, right? How would that, how would that have felt? You probably wouldn't have had, you know, emails. <laughs> you, you wouldn't yeah. have had work on your mind. You would be rested, relaxed. Your heart rate, your breathing rate would have come down. Your body would be in a very calm place. It would have been just that sort of firelight. It would be dark. It would be cool. Loads. Just think about it. Think about what that sort of environment would be like. That is how we sleep best. If you're someone who really struggles with a busy mind, I'd really recommend having like a journal next to you or just a notepad. And if you know that you've got a busy mind, try to mind dump before you go to bed. So sit there, put something in the bubble in the middle of the page, any anything, you know, just to get your thoughts started, even yeah. if it's like do the washing. Because as soon as you put that one thought on that piece of paper, it is going to 
give out more and more and more thoughts. And I want you to keep writing until no thoughts come naturally to the forefront of your mind. And then you've sort of started to empty your mind a little bit. I mean, and a diary, a diary can sometimes be a good one. Isn't it? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Diary, gratitude journaling. What I use with the team sometimes is the sort of the, the three rule. So they write down one thing that's gone well that day. Yeah. Um, one thing that they are proud of themselves for doing. And one thing they're looking forward to. It's really because we all have this negativity bias in our minds that draws our attention to the to the bad things in life and the things that have gone wrong in that day and that child's behaviour and, and you didn't you acted this way and that you know wound them up and this that and the other and that person looked at you and someone drank your milk in the staff room and all this other stuff you know we focus on all the negatives for the day we don't really have a positivity bias built in we have to kind of create our own positivity bias and that feeling of calm and sort of happiness and content for the day comes from looking at the positives so definitely diary journaling mind dumping all of this stuff is really positive obviously you've got loads of apps out there that you know meditation apps yeah. yoga one really quick thing I'll, I'll add if you are someone who does again struggle to go off to sleep try having like a warm shower before bed because in the early in um, non-rem one which is that sort of first stage of, of sleep what happens is your body temperature drops a little bit well non-rem yeah. one and non-rem two in, in the first couple anyway your body temperature naturally drops and that's part of the onset of sleep so if you go and have a nice warm shower and then you come out and you know you're a bit chilly you know you dry yourself off you're a little bit chilly and you jump in bed your body temperature is naturally cooling down yeah so you can sort of almost it, it isn't quite scientific but you can almost jump start that sort of cooling process if you like by having a nice warm shower and cooling yourself down a perfect temperature for the bedroom for most people would be once you get out of the shower, you need to jump in bed. You know where you're just a little bit nippy, you're a little bit cold, you just need to get in bed. That's a good bedroom temperature, which is a lot cooler than most people have their bedrooms. Most people don't have fresh air and most people have a bit of a stuffy environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. Loads of fantastic advice there because, I mean, in terms of, in terms of um, napping, Charlie, I mean, some teachers will come in. And they're, 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 I mean, I I was a terrible at this, um, but you know, uh, at various points, I've been terrible at it. Not all the time, but coming in relatively late, you know, I don't know, six, I don't know, whatever kind of time, and then going straight to bed for like, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half. And then waking up and then you go to bed late and then you, you know, you get up really early again. Um, is napping any good or is it not? So for most good. people, if they come home and they have a nap, it's so basically to give you a bit of context, we've got this circadian rhythm. So it's kind of this rhythm, natural rhythm of the day. It will be things like when your concentration is the highest, when you feel hungry, when you're again, like I said earlier, when you're supposed to naturally feel tired when you're supposed to feel alert. So that's this kind of cycle that we all have. And if you get a good night's sleep, or, you know, you, you know, it doesn't even matter if it's a little bit shorter, but you've got a bedtime and you've got a wake time, your circadian rhythm's pretty well circulated. Now imagine that going in and napping in, in the, particularly if it's sort of 6 to 7 p.m., which is quite late in the day, it's a little bit like putting in like a mini sleep, isn't it? So you're sort of, yeah. kind, you, you, you're potentially going to impact on that circadian rhythm a little bit. And that might then in turn affect sleep. Now, if you are genuinely that tired, it might be worth just sort of bringing your day forward a little bit and then going to sleep at sort of eight o'clock or, you know, mm. rather than napping, yeah. it might be worth just getting a really, um, a really early night. In terms of how many hours we need, there's a, that whole eight hours or, you know, yeah, it's eight, it's eight hours, isn't it? Um, is, 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 a, is a bit of a myth, to be honest. Now, everyone's going to need different amounts of sleep depending on their body, but, we have these things called sleep cycles and you can imagine that they run in sort of like um, 90 minute cycles. So sort of hour, hour and a half. If you think about when you need to wake up in the morning, say I'm going to try and do some maths now. It's been a long time since, since I did any maths. Uh, say that you need to go, you need to wake up at six o'clock in the morning. If you work back in hour and a half chunks, yeah. you, you'll figure out what time you need to go to bed. So if you want to get seven and a half hours sleep, or nine hours sleep, for example, which roughly obviously gets you in those, in those hour and a half marks, you can figure out what time you need to go to bed. And I'd really encourage everyone to add maybe an 45 minutes to an hour on top of that, sorry, 30 to 45 minutes, half an hour, um, 
on top of that or earlier than that so that you've got time to get in bed, wind down, put away your phones, get some screen free time, have a chat if you you know if, if you if you're with anyone, read a book do a Sudoku, read the paper, yeah, whatever you do, something without screens, because that's going to really help you wind down. And that's that's what I say with clients. You know, that's why I generally advise. Some people will feel amazing on six hours sleep. Some people will feel terrible on nine hours sleep. So it, it's, it's such an individual thing, Tom. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I was going to ask you as well about lions. Are lions bad? You know, yeah. you get to like Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and you end up lying in to like ten, eleven a.m. or something. If you're lucky enough to be able to do that, is that good to catch up on the sleep or to laze around or what? Yeah, yeah. I mean, have you ever had that lying where you know, let's say you're normally getting up at six o'clock. Have you ever had that lying, Tom, where you get up at like ten, eleven, and you just feel like you haven't slept? I haven't had one of them since I was about twenty-one or something. I mean, oh, I, right. <laughs> I just wake up at seven, eight every day, whatever yeah. it is. You're I mean, I can one... go back to sleep for a bit, but um, yeah. usually yeah. I can't, actually. They're one of the unlucky ones. Yeah, I feel like, I mean... I'm, I feel like I'm a 75-year-old on here talking to you, Charlie. If I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling, you're making me feel, as this goes on, I'm feeling, oh, doddery gladder. You know what I mean? Like yeah. waking up three times a night to go to the toilet. It's like, yeah. how old are you? Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm supposed to still be young. You think... said before we were the same age. I refuse to believe that. Look at our <laughs> pictures, mate. Look at our pictures. I, I think I think we all uh, we all age differently, and I, I think with the uh, yeah, that's a diplomatic way of saying it. But carry on. Yeah, with, with the toilet thing, I think that happens earlier than we all we all care to admit, really, doesn't it? <laughs> to, to be honest, it all happens younger than we think. Um, but yeah. What we need to imagine is that circadian rhythm, right? At the moment, let's just say your circadian rhythm is your wake-up time, your zone of waking up is around 6 a.m., right? If you then snooze until, or you go back to sleep till 9 a.m. or 10 a.m., it's like we've taken your body and we've switched time zones by three or four hours. Think of it that way, because you've taken that circadian rhythm, thinking of it like a dial, and you've Mm. twisted it three or four knocks to the right. It's almost like you've woken up in a different time zone because your body is used to waking up around 6 a.m. It does it five days a week. It's really, really used to it. And now suddenly it's waking up at 10 o'clock in the morning. So that's why we can sometimes feel a bit groggy because our circadian rhythm is just out of whack. And then we don't feel as tired on Saturday night. So then we stay up to one o'clock and then we're trying to go to bed at 9 uh, 9 p.m. on Sunday night ready for school on Monday and we can't get to sleep. So then we don't go to bed. We don't fall asleep till two o'clock in the morning, Sunday, no, Monday morning. We have four hours sleep. We feel terrible on Monday morning. That is such a common thing for so many of us because because we work so hard during the week. We we need we we, we are knackered. We feel like yeah. we need that sleep. But oversleeping might actually be doing you a bit of a disservice, um, and and you might be doing yourself short by sort of oversleeping. Yeah, and then obviously you've got different things. Like when I was in, um, when I lived in Spain, you know, I was teaching over there, and obviously their time clocks are completely different. They start at about nine a.m. say mm-hmm. in school, whereas in I don't know Britain it might be eight eight fifteen or something, and then they we finish later. You know, I finished at four fifteen teaching. Um, so by the time I got home. Um, and then obviously they go to bed later. I mean, Spanish people tend to, they don't start going out till midnight on a Friday night. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then like for, like in the week, probably their bedtime's like midnight, even for like little kids and stuff. Mm. So for me, what I'd do is I'd have a nap. I'd come in 6.30 or something. I'd have a nap till 8 o'clock. I'd go out for my dinner and then I'd be awake till at least midnight. Um I mean, I know Lucy lives in Portugal, so she'll know all about this. I mean, I don't know if the Portuguese are quite as like that as the Spanish, but they probably are. Um, I, I'll be honest, I loved it, but um, it probably wasn't good for me, you know, long term. Yeah. I don't know. Probably wasn't good for me because um, I, was, I was knackered. I mean, in terms, of, in terms of teacher well-being, you know, we always talk about workload and stuff, which is obviously completely a massive, massive issue. Mm. Um, but what are things that a teacher, I mean, and obviously there's things we could talk about reducing workload for teachers all day long. But yeah. in terms of things beyond work, you know, if you were to say two or three things, because we're coming towards the end. If we were to say two or three strategies, tools, thing, easy wins, you know, if you were to say two or three for well-being that went beyond just workload stuff, 
what would be your two or three things that you think a lot of people don't do that would make a big impact on their lives? Ooh, that is a question. Trying to, pick, trying to pick two or three. It's difficult. It's difficult, isn't it? I, I would say, um, and it's, it's, kind, it's kind of leading on from what I said earlier, so I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give that, give that to you as number one. So number one is going to be, again, these are all going to probably relate back to your mindset and perspectives rather than a, like a practical tool. Yeah. The first one is going to be, you need to change less than you think you do, but you need to change it for longer. So, for example, if you are sitting there thinking, I need to leave work every day at four, I need to get down to the gym five days a week, and I need yeah. to eat chicken, broccoli, and rice four meals a day, <laughs> You, you don't. You don't need to do all of that. You need to do less than that, but you need to yeah. do it for longer than you think you do, right? That's going to be number one. And that kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat here. That kind of ties in with the perfectionist mindset. As teachers, I'm just talking from from experience here. We love to do a good job. We just, it feels great, you know, to do a good job feels brilliant, and and we want to get everything perfect. And unfortunately for one reason or another our personalities uh, the fact that we like to please the fact that we are maybe conditioned by teaching here we're always observed aren't we we're always analyzed and evaluated yeah you've got to be on your toes all the time yeah yeah and and we we apply that to our own health and well-being so what we do is we treat it a little bit like a lesson observation where we're trying to get everything right all the time when we don't get it right even though as teachers day in day out we're preaching growth mindset every teacher i talk to will admit you know quite openly and laugh about it that they probably don't have the best growth mindset themselves and they give up quite easily when it comes to their health and well-being so that's kind of two for one on that one um the second one oh this is difficult (laughs) difficult i would i would say don't go it alone don't go it alone and this that's not a plug for my for my coaching program No, no no that is honestly tell a friend get your sibling involved tell a parent tell your partner don't try and do it by yourself. And that's the other thing that teachers try and do. We want to we want to be able to do it ourselves. It, it feels good. And I'm, I'm, I still struggle with this, Tom, still to this day. I try and do everything by myself. And you can't. You can do anything, but you can't do everything. Right? Yeah. Really, really, really important to remember that. Really important. You need someone to hold you to account to say, hang on, you said you were going to do this. Like, come on, let's go for that walk. You need support. You need a support network. So no matter what it is, whether it is helping you to cut down how much you're marking, whether it is to leave work early that day, whatever. And that's a common a bit of a cliche, isn't it? You know, have one day that you leave early. It is a good idea, though. You know, it is a good idea. Whatever it is, get people around you to support you in that journey. So don't do too much to begin with. Do it for longer. Get people to support you in your journey. Oh, number three. Uh, I don't know. What else have I... I'm trying to think. We could have given two. Said. I mean, I didn't say you had to do three. You can just give yeah, those two. two, two. So, two I mean, two. interesting enough, we've had... We put out a poll on the sleeping thing. Lucy did, anyway. Thank you, Lucy. Um, less than five hours, 13% of respondents so far. Six to seven hours a night, 70% of respondents so far. And... Uh, eight plus hours a night, seventeen percent of respondents so far. Sixty-seven votes in. Um, the poll is pinned to the space, by the way, if you want to have a look at it uh, or answer it yourself. Uh, Mr. Alex has responded by saying, for the last few years, he's had two hours sleep a night. That's wow. even less than that, Gerard. Wow. <laughs> that's yeah. Good I mean, God. I mean, if that's true, I've no idea how any. I'll be honest with you. I don't know how people function on kind of four or five hours no, of, no i'm um i'm I, i'm putting off becoming a parent because i'm terrible without sleep <laughs> yeah I'm and that's dreadful i mean par- parents have to do it don't they I suppose. yeah yeah i don't know yeah. fair play any any parents or people who you know for whatever yeah. reason you're not your night sleep is disrupted fair play to you a round of applause because i I'm, I'm the worst person to be around on on bad on a bad night's sleep Oh, same. Absolutely. And, and I don't know how people teach. I don't know how they get the words out. No. You know, and properly, cognitively. It always it always confuses me. Listen, Charlie, we, we're, we're coming towards the end, mate. It's been absolutely fantastic. You have literally divulged so much knowledge. I'm sure the people who've been here since, since the very start are feeling absolutely empowered in terms of everything you've told them. Certainly I am, anyway. I've picked up so much from what you said. If you've missed some of this, it'll be available 
on Spotify. Just search Teachers Talk Radio on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever you use for your podcasts. Or even go to ttradio.org and, and go to the Listen Back page on there and you can find this. It'll be there probably by the end of tonight. Um, so if, if anybody you know might benefit from this, you know, they could listen to it on the commute in the morning. So send them the link over. But certainly for me, I've, I've gained a huge amount of insight. Now, before we go anywhere, I'm just going to, at the top of the space, uh, Charlie, one last opportunity for you to tell everyone about this amazing event you've got happening next month. So, again, I'll try, I'll try and summarise it, but I, I could honestly go on about it for ages because it is, it's an incredible, incredible event. And I'm not just saying that because we, we put it together, but... It's the first ever health and well-being event for educators, first of its kind. It's called Rewriting Wellbeing, and that sums it up. It's not about, you know, some sort of, you know, paying lip service. You know, here's a here's a policy to look at. You know, here's you know here's some nice soap for the bathrooms. Here's some some cupcakes in the staff room. All things which are appreciated. This isn't superficial. This is actual rewriting what your well-being means for you and the things yeah. that you are doing for yourself and your staff. So it's it's an all-day event. It's 10 a.m to about 4 p.m. It's in London. We're going to look after you. We've got brunch. We've got lunch. We've got teas and coffees throughout the day. We've got a panel of nine amazing speakers. We've got Andrew Cowley, who I don't think needs any introduction, author of and Wellbeing Toolkit and, and numerous other things. Amazing um, speaker, consultant. We've got Jen Fossil. We've got Kimberly Wilson. We've got Lenise Brothers. We've got uh, Dan McFarlane from Mr. Mac Making Memories. We've got um, the guys from Alfresco Learning. We've, we've got an amazing amazing lineup and our team of ambassadors from um edu twitter um from the teacher ground all the online spaces um they're going to be coming as well so there's a chance to sort of meet and greet people that you probably know you probably met um online or you've at least watched their content and stuff um and it's just going to be amazing it's not a boring stuffy cpd session it really 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 is interactive it is immersive bring a friend um you can grab 20 percent off with the code teacher 20 which i think i'll share with you tom um yeah. the the so that's um, t that's t e a c h e r and then the number 20 yeah all one word teacher 20 and um, you can grab 20 percent off your ticket there bring We've got stalls, we've got workshops. It's, it's going to be amazing. It really, really is. And it's all for charity. The whole event is non-profit. All proceeds are going to Ed Support, the amazing education support charity. Um, and yeah, I think, think I've summed it up there, Tom. Superb. And if you want to check it out, it is pinned to the top of this space. And if you're listening back as a podcast, the link will be in the show description or the show notes. So you'll be able to just click that on whatever device you're listening on and you can find out more about it. And if you listen to any Teachers Talk radio shows at the moment, you'll hear a special message from Charlie about it on every single show. Um, amazing, Charlie. So listen, thank you ever so much. And uh, we're gonna, we, we'll are gonna we let you know when everything's published this end so people can listen back. Um, thanks, everybody who's joined live. Um, special thanks to everyone who's, who's, who's popped in tonight. We've had a lot of listeners um, coming in and out. And we've had a, some listeners who stayed the duration. So thank you if you're one of those listeners um, as well. So, Charlie, thanks very much. And to everyone listening, goodbye and good night. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.